Now I'm super excited to welcome to the stage Jen Taylor uh, to discuss building what's next and how teams prioritize. Jen is the president at Plaid and a former chief product officer at Cloudflare. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little loud. Yeah. So welcome to the stage. Thank you. So good to have you here. I'd love to just start out, maybe we give a bit of context to the audience. Yeah. I'd love to know sort of how you got into product and mm. product leadership and what the kind of origin story there was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I could not be more excited to be here. These are my favorite coworkers here in this room. The work that this group, this, this discipline brings really is just transformational, and I'm just so honored to be here. My journey into products started because I fell in love with customers. Honestly, I started my degree in university thinking I was going to law school, and people graduated ahead of me and went to law school, and I realized that was going to be miserable. And so I made a last minute pivot during my last year at university uh, to become a consultant, which uh, is kind of like product management light. But it was through that journey and working closely with customers that I realized that like, my passion is spending time with people, understanding what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do it, their hopes, their dreams, and then working very closely with a cross-functional team to figure out how we build, ideate, and deliver solutions at scale. That's kind of what got me started and, and passionate about it. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't play product manager you know, with my friends. We, we weren't building a startup uh, in kindergarten or anything like that. You know, so uh, this discipline has sort of evolved at the same time my career has evolved. And um, I've been very privileged to have the opportunity to work at some phenomenal companies with some phenomenal people that have just provided great training. That's awesome. So I want to I wanna sort of dive into one of the things that I feel like a lot of people here probably struggle with, which is creating a customer-centric culture yeah. in an organization. Yeah. How have you kind of approached that in the past in roles that you've had? I mean, I think there, there are two things. For me, it's um, walk the walk. Um, and so if you spend time with me in a work context, you'll realize that pretty much every conversation I start, I start with a customer. And, and I do that as a way to sort of demonstrate to the organization, well, first of all, I can't help myself. But um, for me, it's an opportunity to sort of demonstrate to the organization sort of how I'm thinking and inspire them to do the same. Mm -hmm. And then the other is I ask when people have ideas to contextualize it in conversations they've had with customers or how they might test it with customers. And so in many ways, it's just sort of infusing it as an expectation in, in the work that we do. Yeah, totally. Is there anything in particular like, have you seen a particular process or tool help at all? Or is there anything that you've done uh, where you see teams really nail it? Like, is something in particular? Um, you know, I think there are lots of different ways to approach yep. it. And, you know, I think for me, I realize that the way teams engage with customers is a function of, like, the stage of company, the stage of idea, and a bit of, like, the culture of the team. But I think there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, with very early stage ideas where we're maybe innovating ahead of where the market is, it's harder to have sort of direct customer conversation and sort of be like, well, I talked to Bob, and Bob said this, and so I'm going to go build this for Bob. You know, it's a little more abstracted, and you sort of have to bring the customer along. For products that are more mature or markets that are more mature, there's more opportunity to sort of draw on the corpus in front of us. Totally. I, I, I've personally seen like the, the, the power of just putting customers in front of engineers, for example. Oh, yeah. It just, it, it's sort of so motivating, I think, for people to realize that they're, they're, the stuff that they're working on is actually contributing to some you know, improvement in somebody's daily life, right? Yeah. I mean, for me, that's you know, it's people are like, well, so what's the essential skill for product management? And I always say it's communication. And people are like, oh, so you have to be a really good presenter. You have to be a really good writer. And it's like, no, actually, the essential communication skill is learning how to listen. And it is amazing how hard it is for some people to learn how to listen. Um, but if you're able to listen and glean and hear those problems and then find ways to bring those problems alive in an organization, people can't help but innovate. And I think engineers in particular love the opportunity to dig into a big, meaty problem rather than being like, I'd like you to go build me a red dot. And yeah. they're like, oh, dear God, no. <laughs> they're like, you know, if you can actually bring in a problem that enables them to, to sort of bring their best to bear, it's really exciting. Totally. Well, that's a good segue into another sort of thought or question I have, I suppose, which is how do you drive 
that sense of ownership in a product team. Right? You, what you're saying is, is really, hey, bring the problem and, and let the team figuring out, figure it out on their own, that sense of empowerment, that sense of ownership. How have you kind of uh, created that sort of culture? I think for me, it's been a lot about looking to teams to define their goals and their milestones and right. their expectations and the things that they're trying to achieve, um, and then holding them accountable for the delivery of that, that expectation. I, I mean, the people I work with are all smarter than I am. And so, you know, my job is really finding ways to encourage and inspire them to engage with customers, encouraging them to take ownership of the problem, and then looking to them to define the outcomes and then holding them accountable for those outcomes. Yeah, t totally. I, I feel like I quite like the analogy that you sort of define the rules of the game yes. and then let people play it. Totally. And it's sort of like saying, hey, this is our strategy, this is our, this is our vision, yeah. these are the kind of goals that we have, and we're solving within that kind of constraint. Yeah. But everything in here is yeah. totally up to you to figure out how to yeah. solve. And I've really come to appreciate as I've grown in my career and as I've grown through different organizations, how important it is for organizations to provide some of those strategic guardrails like out of the gate. Like what is the true north? Like where are we trying to get? Because then teams can more easily sort of snap in and figure out kind of how and where they fit. I've talked to a lot of founders who are like, whoa, like I don't want to box people in. And it's like, no, it's not about boxing in. That like there's an important part of helping people understand where you're trying to get and then providing some constraints or some guardrails along the way that actually, I think, help facilitate innovation and help facilitate focus. Otherwise, you can just be wandering in the wilderness. Yeah, totally. I, one of the, speaking of sort of constraints and guardrails, yeah. I think one of the things that works really well for us in the last, I would say, six months, we've kind of sort of figured out a bit of a, uh, a sort of framework, I suppose, where we have this laddering, right? So it's yeah. like we have our, our mission, which I shared, yeah. improve the quality of everything, and everybody yeah. knows that. And then we have our product vision, which is this customer insights hub. And then we have a strategy on how to get there, like a sequence of steps. Yeah. And then from there, we have work and goals. Yeah. And all, it all kind of threads the needle down. And I think like, we didn't really have that, I think, for a long time. Yeah. And in the past, yeah, probably six months, yeah. we've developed this quite clear sort of framework. And the team, they can see how their work ladders all the way through, right? Uh, and and, and it's, for me, it's also storytelling. Yeah. It's how can you, you know, how do you kind of play on, on, on to be honest, people's emotions and yeah. say, well, hang on, it's not, it's not a generic yeah. thing. It's actually just a real person who's using yeah. our product. Um, we have somebody here called Jared Forney, who's from Okta, and there he is back there, and he's speaking later today, and Jared's like famous at Dovetail. Um, every, everybody, <laughs> at, at, everyone at, at Dovetail knows Jared, um, and he's always, you know, in, in our showcases and things like that, and yeah. I think if you try to actually humanize your customers and say, no, we're not building for some mass, yeah. right? It's yeah. like not an abstract mass. Yeah. Yeah. It's an individual, usually. Well, and I think that specificity kind of comes back to that sort of, for me, that listening, right? Um, because then you actually, you, you know who you're listening to. Right. But I think the goals are so important to understand why. And the thing that you said that really resonates with me is the narrative and the story that comes with the mission, the product vision, the strategies and the goals. Because otherwise, like if it's just numbers on a page, it's very hard for people to internalize it and figure out how to make it their own. Yeah, totally. So uh, we were talking a little bit before about how difficult it is to make decisions mm. and, and how I feel like for me, that's one of the most difficult parts of a business yeah. and a product team and a PM yeah. is deciding what to build and what not to build. Yeah. Um, prioritization is yeah. sort of infamously one of the most important things you have to get right as a yeah. startup founder. Yeah. Often the opportunity cost of doing something and not doing something else or vice versa is really high. How do you approach my question, deciding what to build next. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are a couple things that I bring into this, and, and one sort of maybe less from like a pure starting from ground zero perspective, but, but sort of a company that is starting to, to scale. You know, I encourage teams when they think about the, the portfolio of what they're gonna build to think about obviously the needs of the customers, but I encourage teams to think about a roadmap as a combination of basically three buckets of things. The first for me that is the most important is I call it trust. This is performance, scalability, reliability, and the quality of the things that we've already delivered, right? Because your relationship with the customer is built on that foundation. Your license to provide them new capabilities and continue to grow and expand with them is built on building, fostering, and extending 
gaining that trust. So that's an important bucket. The second is exactly the work that a lot of us do, which is I've been out in the field talking to customers, they're using this, they'd like this, this, and this, and, and there's some very specific customer requests. And then the third bucket is really what I consider to be, I call it groundbreaking innovation, or just innovation, right? These are the things that like, nobody is asking for, but our observation and our assessment from having spent time in the market is that we think that this is the thing coming around the corner, right? Like everybody says, well, who is it for? That said, if anybody had asked me to build a better horse, you know, I, wouldn't, I can't remember how it goes, but I never would have built a car. And, and that's the sort of bucket of innovation where you can see problems and then an opportunity around the corner. I encourage teams at any point to think about those three buckets as, as a portfolio. And at any point, one bucket might be bigger than another. Um, but I think it's really important for teams to, to sort of give themselves license to invest across all three parts of the business, because I think that that's what it takes to truly delight a customer. And then within that, there's the prioritization within the buckets, which of course is, is the next complicated bit. Yeah, and I suppose that last bucket helping teams see around the corner. Yeah. I mean, that, it, that's hard, right? Yeah. Like, how do you sort of drive that innovation and that creative thinking, especially if you're trying to create a new category? I mean, Cloudflare was sort of creating a new category, right? How do you kind of, like, enable that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are two things. One is to ask for it. I mean, it seems like a basic thing, but a lot of organizations start to forget to ask for it, yeah. right? They get so focused on the, the next release or the next thing that they forget to ask people to bring what actually made them great employees to begin with, which mm. is, give me your ideas, give me your brains. The first is to ask for it. The second is to expect it. And by expecting it, it is making sure that teams have an expectation that if you go back to that rubric that you're talking about emissions, goals, and OKRs, that there is space in there that says one of your OKRs is to continue to innovate. And then finally, I think the important thing is creating a culture of, of learning. And, and it, it's like everybody talks, I've got a culture of learning. It's amazing. Everybody learns. But no, honestly, truly to create the flexibility to experiment, to do it safely, and to create opportunities to have those moments where like, mm, it didn't go awesome, you know, or it didn't go exactly as planned, and, and really make sure that, that those are conversations that people can still have and that they are rewarded for that experimentation. No, for sure. So uh, last night we had sort of a pre-drinks at the conference yeah. and, and I was chatting to a bunch of uh, folks and I think a common theme that a lot of people in this room probably feel is that they don't have as much influence as they would like. Yeah. Like influencing folks is yeah. sort of like a challenge that I just hear over and over and over again. It's like, how can Dovetail help me influence more? How, what would you recommend or what sort of advice would you give, whether it's a product manager or a researcher or a designer who's done some, some research, how do you get those insights and everything in front of the people who, like yourself, who are yeah. setting strategy, maybe in the executive team, for example? Yep. What have you seen work? I mean, strength in numbers, right? Yep. And so that's kind of job one, right? I mean, all of us who operate in building product, we're operating in triads or quads or um, whatever it is. You know, you have a group of people that you're working with as you're building out uh, your, your roadmap and your conversations, bringing those insights into the conversation. Inviting people to contribute their questions is also a really good way to get people sort of, at least at the, at the team level, sort of bought in because everybody has questions and to the extent that you can be helpful in helping people suss out their questions, even if you think they're bad questions, <laughs> even though there are no bad questions, but even if you don't think it's the most awesome question, giving some space and some airtime to it, um, I think kind of creates that initial buy-in. The second is being able to, one, tell the, the next one for me is telling the story of like bringing those insights into a story, being able to do, uh, you know, write a blog post, do a customer reel, post notes from a customer meeting, share the insights, I think is another way to sort of get people interested and curious. And then the third is like, show the victories. Like, don't be afraid to sort of come back and sort of pull the narrative all the way through from everything we just talked about, right? Which is, I've been out, I've been talking to customers, I've been driving insights, we've been asking questions, we use that to help us ideate, here's what we learned, and here was the impact of what we delivered. Um, and helping people sort of see that then sort of gives you, it's, it's a trust that you build over time, so it may not be everything in day one, but it is sort of building that foundation and that culture within the organization that all of us have to do. So like a little bit of sort of show your work. Exactly. Kind of like, oh, okay, like I, I followed this approach, here's what I learned, yeah. here's who I spoke to, yeah. here's my thinking at the yeah. moment, what do you think? Yeah. 
you know, I, I, as, as a founder, I suppose, uh, and, and the um, uh, person who's been running the product team for a while, yeah. I think that uh, for me, it's always very nice when people say, hey, like, this is kind of what I'm thinking. I don't know about this approach or not, but I don't really have any other better ideas right now. Yeah. You know, can we work together yeah. and try and like, riff on this? Yeah. I think a lot of the time when people engage more senior leaders, it's very much a sort of like, I'm going to present my finished thing to yeah. you. I'm going to present yeah, this yeah. polished yeah. thing to you. And I'm like, I don't want to see the polished no. thing. Like, I just want to see the working stuff. Yeah. You know, like, let's yeah. collaborate. I don't want to be this, this sort of stakeholder just sitting there. kind of. <laughs> well, that's the fun <laughs> part, right? The fun part is sort of getting in it and, and yeah. being a part of it. And I think that you know, most people who are now in senior leadership positions started doing that. They right. never really want to give up. The other is, that's also a great way to get buy-in. Mm -hmm. Right when you invite people in to the ideation that you're sort of engaging in and get them, it's a great way. Again, it's a great. The conversations like that are a great way to get buy-in. Yeah, totally. Um, so another thing that's sort of been happening, I guess, which is pertinent in the last 18 months, is the sort of the economic impact and, and the, yeah. the effect it's had on, on certain roles. Right, um, product management, research, for example. Uh, another question that comes up a lot from our customer base is basically like, how do I do a better job, or how does our function do a better job, of essentially um, sort of explaining the business value that we bring, yeah. and almost having that kind of c commercial mind. Yeah. So, because I sometimes think, like researchers in particular, I think are very user-centric, which is awesome. Yeah. But it's like, how do you then um, marry that with the needs of the business, and kind of like, justify your existence, and not just your existence, but extra headcount so you can grow your team. Yep, yep. So I think there are, there are two things that I've seen. So first of all, just like acknowledging. It's been tough, mm. right? It's been a tough 18 to 24 months. It's been very different than I think the environment that we've been in, and I think we're all having to learn and adapt. The things that I've seen that have been effective kind of come back to, okay, if you think about it, these businesses are under duress. Like, we're maybe not sure about our product market fit. Maybe we're change, facing changes in the competitive landscape. Like, how can we help the business better understand the customers that we're trying to service or we are servicing? How can we help them understand what the customers are seeing value from, what the customers are not seeing value from? How can we help them understand the competitive landscape? Like, the importance of insights, everybody's sort of like, oh, you know, it's a really competitive environment, da, da, da. Like, this is when the insights become all the more important. And so to the extent that you can sort of pull those through and tie those specifically to business value, again, I think kind of coming back to the, can I, can I talk to you or help you understand how insights we're seeing in the market directly tied to what we build, directly tied to what we sell, or can I help you on the flip side? We're seeing a lot of attrition from a customer base under economic duress. Let me talk to some of those closed loss customers and help people understand sort of like what might the other side look like. So like yes, yeah, so it's, it's sort of being proactive and trying to figure out like, well, I'm seeing this stuff in the yes, business yes. and this is how I can actually assist the business in whatever it is, right? You know, doing yeah. research, for example, in a specific area. Yeah, because I think the greatest risk that businesses have right now is that in the face of this economic shift and that people decide to just like turtle under, right? Like pull in their heads, pull in their legs, just like hunker down. And like this is the time when like you need as a turtle to like throw out your legs and your head and go sprinting through the fields to find <laughs> insights from customers, right? We're all sprinting turtles in this moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, totally. I, I sort of, I've over the years developed this kind of theory and I sort of hinted at it a wee bit in the keynote, yeah. but I think it's becoming increasingly easier to build stuff. Like, yes. the, it's just, you know, I, I remember when I first started doing computer science, yeah. whenever that was, you know, the early, early 2000s, it was really hard to build things. Yeah. Like, nothing was standardized. We didn't yeah. have the benefits of, you know, everybody's using React and TypeScript yeah. and Postgres, and we're all on AWS, yeah. and we have all these great API endpoints, yeah. and, you know, now we have all this um, AI stuff, which probably lowers the bar to entry, or the barrier to entry even more, yeah. right? So, so it's, it's easier and easier to build something, which is why I believe that building, like figuring out what to build and building the right thing is actually more of a thing now. Yeah. You know, I, I think about um, fundamentally like non-differentiated industries, yeah. right? Like I often think about banking. Yeah. It's like all the banks have the same product. Yes. Like it's, all, it's all the same mortgage product, basically. Yes. Basically got the same mobile app. Yes. So how do you differentiate if you're in one of these industries where 
And I think the same thing's kind of happening to software as well. Yeah. When I was working at Atlassian, we were working on, on Confluence, and we didn't have real-time editing, if you can believe that. And of course, Google Docs had real-time editing, and then Notion came out. And, real and, and, and now, if you launch a SaaS product without real-time collaboration, it's, yeah. you know, what are you doing, yeah, right? Totally. <laughs> so I feel like, given that it's becoming easier to build something, you know, figuring out what to build is just, is just so much more important, yeah. um, which is why I'm sort of perplexed that, that you know, businesses aren't realizing this and are sort yeah. of not investing in this kind of thing. But Bedsod later on has a talk called Investing in Insights Infrastructure. Yeah. What have you seen work, I guess, at Cloudflare and now at Plaid yeah. uh, to sort of drive yeah, a, a greater investment, I guess, in customer insights? Yeah. Um, beyond, besides the culture, yeah. and is there anything that you've done, like a specific initiative maybe that you've rolled out that you were quite proud of? Yeah, no, failing. <laughs> failing is the best way to figure out you need to do it differently. Because yeah. I think that like, you know, talking, I mean, I've been thinking very much about the same thing that you were just sort of talking about, which is like, okay, we live in this world now where like literally probably in the time that we've all been sitting here, somebody in some dark room someplace has ideated something, built it, and pushed it live, right? Mm -hmm. Like the friction to building and deploying things is never been, been lighter, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like I think that sometimes makes it too easy for people to, to sort of I, I'll call it like sniffing your own like glue, like sitting inside a room with glue. like the smelly markers and all of you being like, yeah, that's a brilliant, yeah, we should do this. And, um, and sometimes you kind of just have to let it run, right? Like there's no better lesson for an organization than coming up with a brilliant idea, talking to no one about it, shipping it, and having it like go out like a lead balloon. Mm. Um, and, and it's been sort of picking up on some of those that I've been able to sort of be like, huh. Okay, well, what could we do differently here? Or, or gosh, that didn't go as we expected. You know, and using that as an opportunity to sort of encourage people to think about, like, it's not just all of our own individual brilliant ideas. It's about figuring out how to connect our brilliant ideas with the actual people in the market that are, like, living, the people who want to use it. Because, yeah, you still have to get people to use the thing. So when a, when a project fails, like, how do you approach that with the team? I, I, think, it's a, I think it's, first of all, like, no blame. Yeah. Like, I think the first thing is, like, no blame. Like, we tried it, you know, it did not go as we had hoped. Not going to finger point. Like, what did we learn? Mm. Like, what are the thi like, what's the good news? What was the bad news? Like, what, like, what, like, and, and um, using really kind of that retro mentality of sort of the lessons learned and what would we do differently mm. as an opportunity to encourage people to just sort of step back and learn from it. And then to share those learnings with people within the organization, people on their teams, and then even more broadly, like something that I, that we did a lot of when I was at Cloudflare that I'm really proud of is we did a lot of retros mm. uh, that we posted to our blog. And right. a big reason that we did that is we wanted to make sure that our moments of learning were also learnings for the rest of the market. Yeah, I also find that when you put something out there publicly, it's, it's sort of easier to find years later. Yes. Instead of it being buried in some sort of internal... Yeah. In a wiki. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do something similar. We, I try to encourage our team to publish a lot of things publicly. Yeah. Um, we published a blog last year about our vision and our mission, everything like that. Um, and it's also useful for recruitment too, because yes. people can kind of get a sense of what's going on in the business. Yeah. One of our values at Dovetail is open by default. Yes. And so we try to be very transparent, including with our customers uh, talking about the roadmaps and things like that. Yeah. So uh, I want to I want to touch on um, sort of the future of product management mm -hmm. a wee bit and maybe how you see product management and design engineering, that sort of PD sort of triad, yeah. um, evolving over the next year or two uh, or beyond. Because I feel like it's going through a bit of a moment. You know? mm. <laughs> what do you think? Like, describe to me what the moment is that you're seeing. Well, I mean, I don't know if you heard um, the, the Airbnb podcast uh, last year with Brian Chesky on, yeah. on Lenny's. And they've changed sort of the definition of what a product manager is. And it's, more, it's focused on more on storytelling, actually, yeah. more about the sort of product marketing approach. Yeah. And so I think that, as well, another thing that we hear a lot of is that uh, PMs are, historically, it's like, oh, no, the PMs did a lot of the like, um, ideating, and that, now the yeah. designers do a lot of that. And then now the PMs used to talk to customers a lot more, but now we have researchers who do yeah. that. And so what are the sort of, I mean, you, you, you mentioned it before, a core, a core responsibility is communication. Yeah. But how do you see, I guess, yet a role of PM continuing yeah. to evolve? Yeah. And any advice, I guess, for product managers who may be in businesses today yeah. on how to sort of 
keep up with the times, keep I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think having built my career in product, something very, I'm very proud of. Like, mm. I'm very proud of the products I've built. I'm very proud of the teams I've been a part of. Um, and I worry sometimes in the market as it stands today, we're creating a culture where, at least on the product management side, it's too easy to delegate right. the hard parts of product management mm. what's to a, what's the a, what's other parts. What's an example? Parts. What's an example? I, I mean, it's just kind of like you were saying. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm going to delegate talking to customers to research, mm -hmm. or I'm going to, you know, delegate a, an importance of sort of definition of done to engineering. Um, and I think that it's really important for product managers to continue to stay plugged in and having a greater sense of, of ownership over really solving that problem for the customer and being that tireless advocate for the customer. Now, don't get me wrong. Like One of the things I talk about with product management is that product management is the ultimate art of managing through influence, right? Because everybody's like, oh, product management's responsible for that. But they don't actually have anybody that reports to them, right? It's, it's about being able to build relationship, being able to build trust, being able to align groups of people across engineering and design, marketing, all of those things to really help, help us be successful with the opportunity that we see it. But I think my advice to people who are starting product management today is like, don't take your hand off the tiller. Mm. Like, don't let go of what I consider to be actually the funnest part of the job, mm. which is don't let go of the conversations with the customers, don't let go of their relationships. Like, you need to continue to find ways to bring that customer and bring those problems alive in the organization and that help the organization prioritize, understand, and deliver against those goals. Because at the end of the day, like product managers need to ruthlessly prioritize, and I do not know how product managers can continue to be effective in that if they delegate the things that actually help them build the instinct yeah. and build the insights that facilitate that visioning, that definition, and, and fundamentally that prioritization. T totally. You have to build the intuition, right? Yeah. Like if you're going to make faster decisions, yeah. you have to have that context yeah. right, inherently. No, that's, that's super interesting. I think like one of the things I'm sure a lot of people here are also thinking about is how they take the next step in their career, maybe from yeah. like an IC into a leadership role. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you made that jump yeah. and what perhaps some of the lessons were that you would pass on. Maybe in hindsight, you were like, oh, when I was an individual PM, yeah. IC contributor, and then yep. into a leadership position, and now you're an executive, yep. right? And, and, and even in the president role, right? <laughs> Can I go back to just building product? Yeah. Like, please? I, I vibe with that. <laughs> please. Yeah. Um, you know, I think first and, first and foremost, you know, one of the conversations that I wish somebody had had with me, and one of the things I try to do when I talk to people about career development is like, what is the pot of gold at the end of your rainbow, right? Because it's different for everyone. Mm. And I think it's very easy to be like, well, I'm a product manager, but tomorrow I want to be a CEO. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And maybe. But, I mean, the thing is, you know, um, for me, as I grew in my career, what I realized is two things. I really love customers, and I really love teams. And so, you know, I, early on in my career, was like, do I want to go continue to be sort of that kind of prototypical, like, product management visionary archetype, or do I really want to think about how do I build and scale teams? And for me, the building and the scaling of the team part was the path I decided I wanted to pursue. Now, caution, building software is fun, managing people is complicated. <laughs> people are non-linear, emotional, irrational, wonderful beings, but managing people is, not, is a very different beast than managing software. And I think, you know, for me, I kind of see like three or four clicks in my career. The first was going from individual PM to basically kind of player coach. Yep. So I stepped first into sort of continuing with my day-to-day -day responsibilities, but mentoring a couple of junior product managers. The next one for me was moving from player coach to kind of a pure player role, where I was managing people who were managing product. That was the hardest step for me. Mm. And it was the hardest step because I had to let go of the thing that I really loved, which was actually the doing of the work. Mm. And I had to figure out how to help the people actually be successful at it. And I needed to step out of the day-to-day -day decisions and let them make the decisions and run with it. And it was like, 
for those of you who are parents or your aunts or uncles or you have children in your life, you know, watching somebody do something early in their life or earlier in their career for the first time can be really hard because you're like, mm, don't stick your finger in the socket. <laughs> don't do that. It's a bad idea. You know, but you kind of have to like coach people but then let them do it. It was also really hard for me because I realized there was a very instantaneous feedback loop I got when I built product. Mm. I could build it. I could ship it. People would use it. High five. In leadership and in management, those things became a little more ethereal, and I had to really start to internalize the success of the team um, as the impact that I was able to help deliver. Yeah, th this concept of feedback loops and making them as tight as possible, I think, yeah. is a really great one. Yeah. Like, that's something that we try to do a yeah. lot. Like We do continuous deployments yep. of Tails, so there's deployments going out you know, constantly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm basically trying to get the teams always to, to find new ways yeah. to get features and things in front of customers yep. in as many different ways as possible, whether it's through a beta program or a field trial yep. or through concept testing or something like this. But yep. like, how do we build it and rapidly iterate as fast as we can? Yeah. Trying to think in like hours and days, yes. right? Not like days yes. and weeks and months. Well, and shipping the minimum viable thing. Yes. Right? It used to be when I started my career, I was like, write the business plan, like build the model, <laughs> and it's like a 40-page document. And like by the time you've gotten there, like you've killed it, right? Like you've just killed all the innovation, and you've created this concept that is so big that it will take you forever to build and ship it. Right. And like coming back to what we were talking about a few moments ago, that like you can build and deploy really quickly now, like that is such a gift, mm. because we don't need to sit around a room and perseverate and argue over whether it's this or that. We can build a small prototype and get it out and see actually how it works and use that feedback as learning. No, that's 100% that's, that's uh, true. And I think that, yeah, going back to that point, like um, the benefit of everything getting easier to build yeah. is just that we can test things out like much more rapidly and yeah. get stuff out there and sort of see how it is and iterate. I mean, sometimes we get a bit of feedback from customers that dovetail changes too often, uh, but we're trying to figure it out, I suppose, as we go. And it's one of the challenges actually of building a product that doesn't really exist. Yeah. Is there's not a lot of existing patterns that you can kind of like learn from. Yeah. I think there are like a lot, a lot of products out, out there, like really successful products are great, but they actually had like prior art. Yes. And so all the conceptual model, the IA, like all the stuff had somewhat been figured out and there are existing patterns. Yeah. Whereas um, for us, like we, there's not a lot of prior yeah. art. And so we, we, our team has to sort of like navigate this crazy yeah. winding maze and then we ship something we're like, oh, no, it's not right. Like, That's not right, we rearrange it. So it's like, somebody move my menu. So, sorry, ah! yeah, sorry, here's yeah. a, here's a yeah. feature discovery yeah. dialogue. Bye. Like, <laughs> Um, so one of the last questions I have for you is, is um, about, I, say, I guess, the intersection of like commercialization yeah. and a lot of uh, teams, uh, like businesses have growth teams, yeah. and there's a sort of intersection of, I guess, like how do you satisfy the needs of the user and the needs of the business when it comes to sort of commercialization and pricing and packaging? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we're all familiar with like dark patterns when you go and downgrade and you churn and things like this, and yep. it's like, no, you can't, you can't yep. do this, or we'll, make, we'll change the color of the button so that you have to click the other button. So I'm trying to think about like, what are some principles, I guess, for balancing, yeah, the needs of the business with yeah. what is, you know, f best for the customer, yeah. and how do teams think about that sort yeah. of balance? Yeah, I mean, at the highest level, I think about how are you creating value and how do you capture value? Mm -hmm. And for me, creating value is what are you doing for, for the user? And the capturing of value is then what gives you the ability to, to charge for it. I wish I had like the magic wand on pricing and packaging. I honestly think that this is this is proving to be at this point in Do my not? career. No, Damn. I don't. Okay. Uh, it's proving to be one of the more complicated things because there are yes. lots of different and variable models. They're starting with freemium and moving up and stuff like that. But you know, the things that I, I really try to get teams to do is really think about the creating and the capturing of value. And I also think that it's important to think about um, doing right by your users and helping your us invite your users into how they can help improve the business. Like one of the things that I've really appreciated with the evolution of some of the freemium or some of the just come and plunk down your credit card and, and get going kind of businesses is it enables people to get in and use some of the basic capabilities. It also gives organizations a chance to build a large corpus of users without a large sales team, without a large bunch of things, and to learn from those customers. So if we go back to what we were talking about just a moment ago of sort of building incrementally and learning from users, like having users who are new to your platform and kind of constantly evolving and finding easy entry points is critical. 
the upgrade downgrade thing, yeah. It's that like and that that makes me sad. Like I do feel like to the extent that you can truly understand what the bare minimums are that your users need in order to kind of keep the lights on or get the capabilities out of or like create the value and then the hooks to move them up, I think that ends up being another really powerful one. But you know, finally the other thing that I really encourage teams to think about as they move towards commercialization is to not just focus on how much revenue am I making or how many users have I signed up, but also to look at what is happening with adoption and active usage. I think we can get, I think that product success can get very lost in the financials. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is that truly enduring companies think about not only how do I continue to drive a, a nice revenue business, but more importantly, how do I make sure that people are actually using my product and getting value out of it? Because it's, it's you know, typically what ends up happening is, you know, six, eight, 12 months before a big kind of churn or attrition cliff, you'll actually start to see adoption yep. slow um, or tail off. And, and that's sort of, to me, the early warning signal that like there's, a, there's, a, there's something, something that needs to get sorted out in the product or the pricing and the packaging. Right, I mean, revenue is like an output metric, right? Yeah. It's like an output of something else yes. happening. And you need to figure out like what the input metrics are, which are obviously earlier in whatever the you know, workflow is. Yeah. So, well, we're, we're almost at time for the break. So I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time, thank Jen. You. And um, it was you know, incredible to get some insights from you. And I hope everybody else uh, enjoyed the fireside chat. Um, so thanks so much. Yeah.